In September 1949, an American spy plane on the borders of the Soviet Union picked up samples of radiation at high altitude. As President Truman explained to the American people, it could mean just one thing. We have evidence that within recent weeks, an atomic explosion occurred within the Soviet Union. The world had woken up to the threat of nuclear weapons four years beforehand, in 1945. To end the Second World War, the Americans had dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima in Japan. It became clear then, whoever controlled such weapons could alter the balance of world power. For four years, America alone had the technology. But now, with the news of these secret Soviet tests, it seemed the communist world had caught up. This program tells the story of how Stalin got his bomb. Agent Lamp here, Klaus Fuchs. I've taught them everything I can remember. I want to make it clear. I have nothing more to give you. That's just a few more questions, Klaus. Agent Lamphere's come all the way from Washington. Eight months after the Soviet test, in May 1950, an American agent of the FBI was given permission to question a British citizen serving time in Wormwood Scrubs. The prisoner's name was Klaus Emil Fuchs. I just thought you could tell me what you told Mr. Scarden here, starting from the beginning. And take your time, Klaus. We're not going anywhere. German by birth, Klaus Fuchs had worked as a nuclear scientist in both Britain and America. But secretly, throughout that time, he'd been passing information to the Soviet Union. In 1945, he'd passed over the greatest secret of all how to make the atom bomb. His story is that of a man caught between East and West, in a decade that saw relations between America and the Soviet Union collapse, from wartime alliance to the post-war hostility of the Cold War. For his treason, Fuchs was sentenced to 14 years. So what do you want to know? What made you a communist? Seems a good place to start. It's all in the file. I was German. See it from my point of view. Hitler's Nazis had come to power. All of a sudden I had no country. My country flew a swastika flag. To be a communist was to show your hatred for the Nazis. That's how it began. I was beaten up by brown shirts. I was left in a river for dead. I escaped. I came to Britain. But you stayed a communist. I don't see these distinctions between nations. I see distinctions between people. Ruling class, working class. An international brotherhood of workers. And many of the scientists I worked with thought the same. In Britain, in 1941 this was, I read communist literature, Marx and Lenin. It was exciting. Exciting? Because it was so scientific. For the first time, a theory explaining how people behave, the building blocks of how society works, if you understand the building blocks, you can control history, build a better future. Meanwhile, we were studying the atom, the smallest building bricks of matter, learning to control nature. We thought there was nothing we could not achieve. Fuchs's research into the process of splitting atoms of uranium was at the cutting edge of science. This theory of fission was only two years old 
but already it had generated great excitement across the world. In Russia, scientists like Igor Kurchatov knew as well as anyone what this work meant. Splitting atoms would set off a chain reaction in which vast amounts of energy would be released. It could be used to make a super bomb like no weapon ever seen before. But in June 1941, one month after Fuchs began work for the British, the German army invaded Soviet Russia. At this desperate time, Soviet atomic research was shelved in favor of more urgent short-term needs. From my point of view, of course. When the Germans invaded Russia, it simplified things. How do you mean, simplified things? Well, it's hard to explain. I had no doubt that I disliked much in the West. Britain was riddled with class snobbery. There was injustice. There was depression. Didn't stop you taking British citizenship? No. But just as much I was suspicious of Stalin. I felt, as a communist, I should admire Russia more. But there was much I disapproved of. So, when Hitler turned on Stalin, it made it easier. Now I felt truly Russia was my real fatherland. The sacrifice forced on Russia to fight this terrible war. It was the least I could do. So you passed them information? Just a little to start with, and then a little more. In late 1941, Fuchs handed copies of his work on fission to a Soviet official in London. But his actions are hard to judge. After all, with Russia fighting Germany, the Soviet Union was now Britain's ally. The Red Army fights on with a gallantry that not only excites the admiration of its allies, but must be causing grave doubts about final victory in the minds of the German people. British propaganda praised the Russians but the Russians looked for more than admiration. They needed their allies to attack Germany from the west to take the pressure off this slaughter in the east. At a terrible cost, that attack was delayed three years. Fuchs believed the delay was deliberate. It was disgraceful. A fight to the death, that's what it was. And Britain and America just sat by and watched. It wasn't like that. D-Day took years to organize. We couldn't afford to botch it. You know what Truman said? He said, if we see Germany's winning the war, we should help Russia. If we see Russia's winning the war, we should help Germany. Let them dispose of each other. That was in 41. He wasn't president in 41. He wasn't speaking for America. No. But he was saying what you were all thinking, wasn't he? To some extent, Fuchs was right. The differences between capitalist West and communist East were deep-rooted, only papered over by this wartime alliance. In fact, it was the war itself that showed many in the West how powerful Soviet Russia had become. Russian bayonets and Russian tanks there was a growing awareness that today's friend might be tomorrow's enemy. In 1943, without telling their Soviet allies, the British and Americans combined their atomic programs and Fuchs moved with the British team to America. They lived and worked in a US Army camp at Los Alamos in New Mexico. The Manhattan Project boasted the greatest concentration of scientific talent the world had ever known. Their vital task, to produce an atomic bomb before the Germans got there first. Despite his natural awkwardness, 
Fuchs made friends in Los Alamos, but all the time he was living a double life. It was as if I'd split my mind into two separate compartments. In one compartment, I let myself make friends and be free and easy and happy. In the other compartment, I kept my duty to Soviet Russia and my meetings with my contact in Santa Fe. Codename Raymond. So, yes, in my mind, my fellow scientists were both friends, but also people I could betray. In 1945, the Manhattan Project was ready. Just before dawn on July 17th, in the desert 90 miles from Los Alamos, the countdown to the world's first atomic explosion began. prepared for it for so long, but still it left us astounded. This extraordinary force we'd unleashed, as if we'd conjured up the sun itself. We stood there in our dark glasses. There were shouts of celebration, but also such awe. In 1945, by comparison, Soviet nuclear research was still in its early stages. On a secret forest site 200 miles from Moscow, a research base, Arzamas 16, had been set up. But in the spring of 45, the pace at Arzamas had slowed almost to nothing. These home movies show Kurchatov, the scientist in charge of the project. He'd grown his beard in the war's early stages and had once vowed never to shave till the war was won. Now that victory over Germany had at last arrived. The Red Army was in Berlin, bringing to a close four years of struggle. As Kurchatov's biographer later described, it seemed for the scientists the pressure was now off. We've been building a cyclotron, a uranium graphite atomic pile and other structures. We saw them being built from the lab windows. And now, almost at once, you felt the tension lifting because with the fascists wiped out, it was clear to everyone this new weapon would no longer be needed for victory. Instead, we thought we could turn our efforts to finding peaceful uses for nuclear energy, developing breakthroughs in medicine, cheap energy for power to lighten human labor, research for the good, not destruction of mankind. For almost all Soviet citizens, it was a time of strange mixed emotions. The war had hit the Soviet Union unbelievably hard. 27 million people are thought to have died. 25 million left homeless. Industry was ruined. Famine was near. But at least the war was over. Despite everything, this was a time of triumph. And in this triumph, Soviets and Americans were shoulder to shoulder, as never before, joint conquerors. At the victory parades in Red Square, American generals stood at Stalin's side. It seemed to ordinary Soviets that out of suffering might at last come a time of peace in which to rebuild. But it was a naive hope. And it was the bomb that woke people up to this naivety. So far, no ordinary citizen, American or Soviet, knew of the existence of nuclear weapons. But in August 45, just three weeks after the Los Alamos test, 
Atomic bombs were exploded for the first time in anger for real. The bomb drops at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, ordered by Truman to end the war against Japan, gave the world a graphic glimpse of America's newfound strength. The power to destroy, at a distance, whole cities, entire civilian populations. To the Russians, Hiroshima seemed a direct warning, against which their cities had no defense. It was atomic blackmail, pure and simple. We knew now there'd be no time to recover. The German war was over, but now we faced a new war, not of blood, but of nerves, against our former ally, America. And we, the scientists, were in the front line. Kurchatov was called to Moscow. There was a meeting. Stalin told him, one demand of you, comrade. Give us the bomb in the shortest possible time. We are in great danger. Despite the desperate state of the Soviet economy, the industry necessary for atomic research was rushed into existence. Not just scientists and labs, but processing plants, reactors, vast mining operations for uranium and graphite. The thousands of laborers involved were prisoners, slaves supplied by the secret police. But as the scientists put it later, this was no time to be particular. There was, it's hard to describe, a special atmosphere. We thought only that we must complete our task as soon as possible before the American atom bomb fell on us. But also there was an urgency which was more personal. To put it bluntly, we knew that if we failed, we would join the prisoners and that other scientists would be found to fill our shoes. But in this scramble for a solution to the atomic problem, Kurchatov did have one enormous advantage. A complete description of the American bomb, drawings and all, courtesy of Klaus Emil Fuchs. Was this the man? Was this your contact? Raymond, yes, he looks more fleshy than I remember. But you'll testify that this man, Harry Gold, was your contact in the States. All that time, I never knew his name. We met in Santa Fe in the summer of 45. I'd taken leave from Los Alamos and driven through New Mexico. It's the most beautiful landscape in the world. Beside me, an envelope containing descriptions, calculations, even a scale drawing of the barn. Of the test barn, yes. I drove to where we'd arranged, parked under the tree. The sun was so hot. And then I saw him approaching. Code name, Raymond. And we talked briefly. He took the package walked off toward the bus station. I never saw him again. When he was caught later, Fuchs never showed any regret for what he'd done. Only a sense of double responsibility that having helped make such a terrible weapon for one country, he then handed it on to another. The FBI estimated his treason pushed Soviet research forwards by at least five years. The 
The first breakthrough was on December the 25th, 1946, when our first atomic reactor went into operation. On the loudspeaker, the first clicks were heard from the counter, speeding to a steady hum as Kurchatov raised the lever. On that day, we produced just a few micrograms of plutonium, but it meant that the atom bomb was no longer a secret to us. And then, of course, the second milestone. August 29th, 1949. The greatest day of Kurchatov's career. There had been prepared a test site on the sun-scorched steppe of Kazakhstan. A large depression surrounded by hills, in the center of which a steel tower had been built. I remember seeing the guinea pigs, the horses and cows and flocks of birds flying from the waterless desert to the man-made water pool in the center of the bowl. Soon they would be turned into steam, ionized together with the pool and scattered around the steppe. We felt nature gripped by a weight of silence. And then... For his part in removing the threat of American atomic blackmail, Igor Kurchatov was showered with honors. The Stalin Prize, the Order of Lenin, a hero of Soviet labor. Meanwhile, the Americans began their search to discover how the Soviets had got their bomb so soon. By coincidence, within days, unscrambled coded messages led to Klaus Fuchs as the source of the leak. Within just four years, the arms race moved on once again. This time, the Soviets overtaking the American lead. The hydrogen bomb, first exploded at the Kazakhstan test site in August 53, made the atom bomb seem trifling. Kurchatov, the bomb's designer, is said to have muttered, it's monstrous, it's terrible, it must never be allowed to be used. Such weapons cast a shadow on superpower relations for the next 40 years. <laughs> 